Thank you for having me here today. My name is Braden Kowitz. Uh, I want to talk about design culture for about 15 minutes. Um, culture affects our behavior in tremendous ways, and I want to start with that example in an elevator. I'm glad so many of you rode one. This is an example from Candid Camera a long time ago. The guy is, is like being normal, right? He's facing the front of the elevator. The other person in the elevator, as you can see, is facing the back, which has got him a little weirded out, you know? And the folks at Candid Camera sent more people into the elevator and told them to face the back. So look at this guy's face. He's not quite sure what to do when all these other people are behaving differently. Now he's got a decade of experience riding elevators. Folks, what will he do? Oh yeah. <laughs> Who wants to try this tomorrow in the elevator with some friends? I totally want to do this now that there's elevators here for me. This is a great example of group norms. And it's a good example of how, even though we don't know why we might be doing something, uh, the behavior of others can affect us. Uh, so, design culture. Designers are really good at saying, that company has great design culture, this company has horrible design culture, but you know what, it's kind of fuzzy. Like, I'm not really sure what that means. And so what I'd like to do in this talk today is kind of describe and give us some, some definitions of what a good design culture might be like. And then if we wanted to change it, like, how would we do that as well? Um, now, I care about this because I work at GV. It's a venture capital fund, and I'm a designer there. My job is to help all the companies we invest in to help them build better products. So uh, more and more entrepreneurs are coming to me and they're asking me about this design culture thing because they know it's important. They know it affects their hiring. They know it affects their retention and the productivity of their designers. It affects all these things, happiness, right? Um, but all I could do for a while was just tell them the stuff I saw other people do. So I saw design teams go to this beautiful place. Does anyone know where this is? The Ames House. Yes, have you been there? No, who's been there? I am jealous of you. Um, I've seen design teams go here, but you know what? It does not actually magically infuse the Ames talent into your, into your culture, unfortunately. Um, I've also seen design teams work a lot on their office architecture and make it a beautiful and inspiring place to work. I would love to work in a beautiful office, but it also does not help with the design culture in your organization. And I've seen designer, design teams take more drastic approaches too. I've seen them sort of circle the wagons and build little microcosms of culture in their organization, sort of like a design agency within a big company. This, unfortunately, also does not work. Even though you can do great design work in this little bubble, you can't get it out through the rest of the organization. So, what does work? So well, unfortunately, I am not an expert in this. I only have a little bit of experience. I have worked with about 100 startups over the past six years, and what I've started to do is to see some themes, some cultural values that I've noticed in companies that deliver great design to customers. So today I'm just gonna go through a couple of those and also talk about some associated activities with those, with those values. And the first is that companies that deliver great design have faith in quality. They believe that it's worthwhile building something of quality even if they can't measure it. And I know you're thinking like, of course designers are gonna come up here and be like, you just gotta believe, man. <laughs> just like, there's no way to measure this stuff. But hear me out just for a little bit. Uh, we work in places that are so measurable, right? We're always talking about A-B testing this, what was the ROI of that? And in general, this is such a good thing because it means we're using the scientific method and data to make our products better for customers. But there's still loads of things that we can build that are very hard to measure, yet valuable for our customers. And the first time I really experienced this, this flip between those two was a long time ago when I was building a little button for Google called the Google Checkout button. Uh, it let you go onto an e-commerce site and check out with your Google account. Now, the design team, we started with something simple. I did this, and then I went into a design review with PMs, and they said, this has to look more clickable. People have to see this on the screen. So we added a drop shadow or a gradient, and then a drop shadow, and then we put the Google logo on it. Who thinks this is going in a good direction? <laughs> Who thinks it's going into a bad direction? Raise your hand. Okay, yeah, I was with you, and so I talked to my design mentor at the time, and I said, what should I do here? He said, what you should do is design the most gaudy, horrible button you've ever seen and take it back to the team. I had no idea why he said this, but I did it, because it sounded fun. I was like, what's more clickable than blue? Red. How do you make sure people see it? You put flames on it. <laughs> Yeah, but how do you make sure people click on it? You offer them a free iPod. <laughs> which should date me, I think, as well. Um, so I brought this back to the team, and we all had a really good laugh. And then we sat down and talked about our goals. Because it turned out we did want people to see it and click on it, right? 
but we also wanted the people that just saw it to have a good impression of our brand, to have it, the button indicate the experience that would follow, and maybe one of those people that didn't click on it would consider it next time. And I don't think this button would do that. So at that moment, our team had this faith in the stuff that we couldn't measure, and we made a balancing decision uh, based on that faith. Of course, you've all heard that teams do what they measure, right? And that's very true. So if you've got this thing where like, we do what we measure and we believe there's unmeasurable stuff that's important, whoa, like how do you design an organization that does that? Well, I think you need advocates for the unmeasurable. And as designers, this is one of our big roles in organizations, there's other people in organizations that do this. But as a leader, I think it's your responsibility to look at the people that are around the table in your leadership meetings or in any meeting where you're making these decisions. Some of them should be optimizers that are great at looking at data and helping us make decisions, but other people should also be these great advocates for the unmeasurable. And as a designer, you don't get to choose necessarily who's around the table at all of these, these different meetings, but what you can do is try to be as effective as possible when you're in these meetings. And that's where I think critique comes in. I wish I could talk for hours about how to do critique well, but all I'm really gonna say is that it is a hard skill that you can learn yourself and one that you can teach around your organizations. Uh, the example I like best is actually the company Pixar. They're so different than the world of software where I work. Um, in software, you can launch something, and if it doesn't work, eh, whatever, just kind of A-B test it and like, launch it again and again and again and again, and hopefully get to something good. Pixar has one chance to launch a movie and make sure it's good. And if you read about how they do it, Ed Catmull has, Ed Catmull has this amazing book on it. A lot of what they've built in their, in their company is a culture and process around critique. It's one of the ways they get there. Um, so that's the first idea, that companies need faith in, in quality even if you can't measure it. But as a, as a founder, as a leader, you can't just hire 10 designers and just like leave them alone and have faith that it's going to work. You also need to hold them accountable for delivering or, a value to your organization. And I say that honestly because us designers, we often focus on the wrong things. There are lots of products out there that we would all say are beautiful and easy to use, but they're not around anymore. And a lot of times this is because the product team and the design team wasn't focusing deep enough on the types of value that needed to, the company needed to deliver to the market. So my very rough, broad, broach, uh, broad brush strokes kind of view of this is that design teams can apply their focus in a couple different ways. The first is surface value. This is like, if you run a design agency, what you get a design award for. If you're on, on Dribbble, this is what you would get followed for. This is the beautiful stuff all designers love. And as designers mature in their career, they usually start to shift to user value. They go out and talk to customers, and they come back to the organization, and they're advocates for those customers. They try to get everyone to build stuff those customers would like. And that's good. But you still may not be extracting enough value from the market in order to keep your, your company alive. So what the design team really needs to be focusing on is business value, um, sort of balancing these two needs back and forth. Well, it's hard. It's hard to do, like, day to day to focus on, like, what should I do to, to have impact on the bottom line of my business? So as a leader, we should figure out ways to hold our teams accountable to this stuff. And my best way to think about this is the commander's intent, which is something from the military, actually. In the military, if you're giving someone an order on the battlefield, a mission, um, it's all fine and good, but the realities of the battlefield are that you have all sorts of stuff happens and you have to replan along the way. So the commander's intent, and I'm very, very simplifying it here, is a way to envision, help uh, the people that work for you envision what the world is like at the end so that they can replan when they're out there. So here's, here's an example from startup. Let's say your boss says, design me a new email campaign. As a designer, we should realize this is not the commander's intent. This, this is, this is not the reason why they're asking it. So we have to dig and ask why. And maybe we want an email campaign because we hope it'll get us more engaged users. But why? Well, hopefully those engaged users will start paying us more. But why do we care about that? Well, we need a scalable business model. But I'm a designer, why should I care about a scalable business model? Because we're fundraising in two months and if we don't raise a round, we're out of business. So now all of a sudden I care. Uh, and this is so important to give to your teams because you don't get to talk to them every single day. And so when they get deep in the weeds and they realize, oh no, this email campaign probably won't work, what you want them to do is be like, I wonder if there are another way to engage customers, or maybe there's another way to get more people paying for our service. So if you're, if you're a designer, I would suggest try to dig for that commander's intent, and if you're a leader, try to make sure that you're connecting the small projects all the way down to the, to the bottom line if you can. Because designers always want the seat at the table, 
And I found the more that you can communicate the commander's intent, the better people really feel like they have a seat at the table. So, second one, hold people accountable. But you can't just hold the designers accountable for great design. Actually, you need to make design everyone's job in the company, which I know sounds super crazy, but bear with me for just one more minute, because I'm gonna take us back in time into the world of really bad software. So has anyone heard of the software quality movement? This is like 70s, 80s, cool, a couple people, awesome. So we used to have bad software, it's hard for us to remember. It was like very buggy, all these products were, were slow, and they were over budget, um, and a bunch of engineers got together and said, we have to fix this. And they looked at how teams were operating. Now, there were lots of things that movement found, but one of the biggest ones was that within these engineering organizations, there were two teams. One team was focused on writing code, and, and writing code as fast as possible. And the other team was focused on testing that code and debugging and focused on quality. It turned out quality was in a corner. It wasn't everyone's job. And these two teams, they never got along. But more importantly, they never managed to deliver quality software. So what did they do? They changed what engineers did day to day. So now if you work with an engineer, they'll write a unit test or they'll, they'll do some, some of that work and it seems normal. But that's a huge departure from the way that they used to work. All right, let's fast forward. What, are, what is organizations like today when we care about product quality? People are already laughing, this is good. Uh, so we've got engineers and product managers now kind of figuring it out and focusing on speed and we say we care that this is delivering value to our customers, design team you figure it out. And it's the same thing as what engineers figured out 30 years ago. Um, you can't take the idea of quality and give it to a small team in your organization and expect it to work. So what does that mean for design? Well, just like the engineers started writing tests, I think everyone in the organization is going to start to need to do more design-like activities. Not that they need like color theory or to go in Photoshop every day, but um, learning critique is one little example. In fact, I think the biggest example where it's useful for everyone in the organization to do a little bit of design is in user research. Uh, my friend Jared Spool recommends, he's got this great recommendation that I think it's two hours per employee per every six weeks that you should get exposed to customers. And this means watching people, real people use your product or real people use, use your competitors' products. I've found no faster way to just align everyone in the organization around the right type of value. And as designers, actually, I think we, it sounds really great, actually, if the whole organization is gonna be aligned with us and helping us, but we also have an obligation to serve the rest of the company. Because we have the superpower as designers, right? We can take this um, abstract concept that we have in our head and sketch it out and prototype it and make it look way more real than it actually is. That's incredible, it helps our ideas spread much better than, than anyone else's. But if you truly believe that everyone's doing design, you have to, uh, come, to, the, come, to come to grips with the fact that great ideas can come from anywhere. And I think it's our obligation to, to lend our superpower to other people in the organizations. So when a marketer or a CEO or an engineer has an idea for something, we should help them sketch that idea and make that idea real. This is probably the easiest way to, when I talked earlier about like a bubble in the organization, how design kind of cuts itself off, this is the best way I've found to get design really integrated deeply across the organization. So those are the first three patterns I've, I've kind of realized, and mostly I just want to start a conversation here. The idea that we need to have organizations that have faith in quality even when we can't measure it. And that we can't let designers just you know, focus on the surface, but we really have to hold them accountable for delivering value to our business. And that it's not just the designers that matter, but design should be something that everyone does a little bit of in our organizations. I love working with designers because we have such a need to make. You know, we, we notice when stuff is a little bit broken, when the microphones are a little hard to use, and we can't help but dive in with our toolkit and fix it. But often we think about the cultural around us as just something kind of innate. Like it just formed and it doesn't really matter and we can't really change it anyways. But I don't believe any of that is true. And it reminds me of this moment in history where uh, the UK government uh, had to rebuild the House of Commons. It had gotten damaged in World War II. Uh, and they were arguing about how they should redesign it. Should it be redesigned more like a modern assembly, like this exact room here? Or should they maintain their adversarial uh, like right and left layout here? And Winston Churchill said, we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. Very famous quote. And I think what he realized was that the environments that we're in sort of define the type of work that we can do. And so my challenge to all of you as designers is to own your culture and shape your culture. 
take our toolkit and our abilities as designers, go find stuff that's broken, go and fix it in your organization, and when you figure it out, you should let us all know so we can all live in happier uh, places. Thank you. Sure, we'll, we'll do two questions. How's this? Yes, right here. Sure, sounds good. Absolutely, the question is how do you get non-designers to critique well? Um, constraints and modeling are the, the core ways that I've done it. So constraints, for example, I make sure that all the designers stand up and give a goal before they give a presentation, and that helps kind of anchor the room in what they're supposed to be doing. Um, I also like making sure everyone writes their feedback in silence as we're sort of simulating the experience that the user's going, going through, and then afterwards, go through each person in the room and ask them for just one piece of feedback before we open, open the table. That helps kind of everyone start to hear and it, particularly, I like putting the leaders last because it calms them down. They're like, oh, I have this list of 20 things, but oh, this team's got like 18 of them, so let me just mention these two. Um, and then modeling is you know, bringing non-designers into the room and showing them what a really good critique is like, showing them the language that we use, the, how we kind of dig in and ask questions, all those different parts of it. Helps people learn what they should be doing. It's kind of back to that group norm stuff. Yeah, another question? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, there it's on. Um, thank you. So you, you ended up uh, with the cultural issue, right? Um, mm -hmm. Now, when you're building a global product or cross-cultural product, how do you actually uh, handle that issue? I mean, you, you have different designs accepted by different cultures, but you're building something to bridge the gap or bridge the... the uh, the cultural differences. How do you actually come up with uh, the solution? Well, so I, uh, that's a really great question. Um, I've, I've worked on a couple products that have, like particularly at Google, that went across many different cultures. And I think the team that probably did it the best was the Maps team. And, they, and the way that they did that was to actually have employees in all the countries that they deeply cared about. And they, and they did a lot of uh, ethnographic research in those countries. They learned that landmarks were very important in Japan, but they weren't import as important in New York. They learned that like there were in Japan, there were 20 subway entrances, while in New York there's like three. And all these things have big differences with how you actually draw the map. Um, for me, a lot of that comes down to uh, humility, knowing like if I think I'm gonna build something for these people on the other side of the world, like I should realize that is a very big challenge it's hard for me to have empathy. And also uh, a faith in user research that if we really don't know what we're doing, we should spend a lot of energy talking to customers and iterating with customers to try to figure out the answer. Yeah. Thank you very much, I appreciate it.